What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Dr. V Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Verga. Today, I have an amazing guest. I actually met him at my gym. I have worked with his wife as a posing coach. He's a phenomenal individual. He is a uh, combat veteran, former Marine. He was law enforcement for years before moving to Texas, and now he runs his own business. He owns multiple gyms uh, currently in, uh, in his area, in part of Texas, so he owns a few powerhouse gyms. He is also starting his own clothing brand, which he'll explain a little bit more about in this video. His parents were immigrants to the United States. They literally worked from the ground up. He joined the Marine Corps shortly after. So it really is a story of the American dream and not just any American dream, a veteran's American dream. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. So to kind of start things off, uh, do you want to just introduce yourself, who you are, your childhood growing up, how you landed in the Marine Corps, and uh, and, how you got to where you are? Sure. Hey, so uh, my name is Martin Madrigal, for those that don't know me. Obviously, I'm not into famous or anything like that, so people want to know who I am. They've probably seen me around. Uh, For those that know Martin Madrigal, I was born and raised in Northern California. Uh, My parents migrated from Mexico back in the 70s. Um, for ever since the 70s, they would come back, work here in the fields, um, and then once the, the season was over, they'd go back to Mexico and then come back again until they were able to go through the whole long process of becoming a U.S. citizen and all that stuff. Um, so growing up, I mean, we never had, like, nothing crazy expensive. Like, we just had the bare minimum. We had a roof over our head. My parent, my dad, my mom were always working all the time, working late in the fields. Um, we never had a chance to play sports because we never had nobody to take us. And plus, my grades were never good. Like, I was always at the very, very, very bottom. My brother, though, I got one brother, uh, no sister, just one brother. Um, he's five years younger than me. So he's the complete opposite. Growing up, he was always straight A's, honor student, everything. And I was just the complete opposite. I was always cutting school, getting in trouble, getting written up, you know, <laughs> doing that whole mess and stuff. So from a young age, like all my family would always tell my mom and my dad, like, hey, he's going to grow up being a gang member. He's going to be in trouble. He's going to go to jail. So I always had that in the back of my mind. Um, and coming coming up from like, I wouldn't say nothing because we were still blessed to have what we wanted when it came to food. Like we weren't like poor, but we never had like the extracurricular stuff, extra stuff that other kids had at school. So at school, we'd always get um, made fun of because of our clothes. We had to get food from the cafeteria. Um, my English was kind of bad, so I was in ESL. So I would always struggle, you know, with trying to have friends. I only kind of clicked with, like, friends that were like me, that were kind of like ESL, only second language as, as uh, English. And then my mom only do very, my mom knew very, very minimal English. So it was very frustrating trying to get help with school homework because she knew how to do it, but her all the way, like back in the days. And I was like, well, that's not what they're teaching me at school. And like, I remember crying every day, trying to do my homework. And then I would tell them, like, hey, like, they don't like me at school. My teacher's always mean. And I hated school. Like, I, I just hated it. Um, so, and then in the summers, like, we'd always go work with my dad and my grandpa out in the fields. Um, so our childhood was good. Like, we obviously, I never got abused or nothing. Obviously, just a regular punishment. Growing up in a Mexican household, you know, <laughs> the cinto, the chancla, uh, that, that was that was a, a normal thing, especially for me, because I was always getting in trouble. And my mom was like, hey, just wait till your dad gets home. You know, they're watching that. I'm like, damn, all right, cool. <laughs> so we got ready. Um, but that's that's the way it was. I mean, it was fun. Um, and fast forward, you know, like I think it was I was a freshman when September 11 happened. Um, I was just sitting there and then I saw it on TV. And then I was just like, it caught me, caught me off guard. I was in shock, of course, like everybody else was. Um, and at that moment, I knew that I needed to do something. I was only a freshman. So me, you know, I called the recruiter's office. I'm like, hey, I want to I want to join. And I think I called at the time it was the Army. It wasn't even the Marine Corps because I just wanted to join the Army because that's what you saw, really. You know, like, oh, you're too young. Like, you're still a freshman. You can't even, like, there's no point in you even, like, coming. Uh, we need to have a diploma because at that time a diploma was a requirement. And at that time I was at the bottom of the barrel. 
So my counselor had already told me like, hey, you're not gonna graduate in time because you're already behind credits. You can have to go to summer school, night school, just to even catch up to possibly have a chance to get a diploma. So then freshman year goes by, you know, so I gotta, I need to do something for myself because I, you know, I got, I got tired of seeing my dad working hard on, in the fields. Uh, my mom also working hard and then my brother doing excellent in school. I was like, I need to do something for myself because I'm not, I don't like school and I don't want to be like, hey, mom, I, I want to go to college and then you pay for it. And then, and then I fail. I don't like it. So now I feel like a total failure because now I'm, I'm making you guys pay for it. And it's not something that it's in my passion. Like, I don't want to do it. So then probably I think at the end of sophomore year, I was finally able to sign up to the uh, pulley program, which is kind of like a, it's a program that they have for, for the Marine, the Marine Corps. And well, little backtrack to that. The reason why I ended up going to the Marine Corps is because I had two friends that joined the pulley program a year before I did, because they were a year ahead of me. They were juniors and seniors. And then one of them graduated as a senior, came back in the uniform. And I was just like, oh shit, that's badass. I want that uniform. And he's like, well, hey, just to let you know, this is the hardest, it's the hardest boot camp that you're gonna do. He's like, if you want something easier, you know, go to these other branches. And I was just like, oh, at that time, I was like, I don't know, I just wanna, I wanna do something. So I remember going into the uh, Air Force recruiting office. Uh, this, my mom, my mom and dad didn't even know I asked one of my friends to go take me. I went in. The Air Force guy was like, "Yeah, you don't have enough. Your grades are too low. Uh, your ASVAB that you took is too low. So there's nothing that we can do for you here." I was just like, "Oh, okay." So then I went next door to the Marine Corps because that's where my friends had already gone. And I was like, "Let me go talk to these guys and see what's up." I walk in. Uh, it was a Staff Sergeant Alton. I still remember his name. Scout sniper, awesome dude. He was uh he's from Europe. I don't remember what country he was from, but he's like, What's going on, Martin? Uh, what, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to be a Marine. He's like, Okay, he's like, it's hard. I was like, that's fine. And then he's like, just know like it's gonna be 13 weeks of hell, and you have to go to your MOS school, you have to go to another MCT, and then you're gonna get deployed. And he's like, What do you want to do for your MOS? And I was like, I just want to shoot guns. Like, I want to go to Iraq. I, I just want to be out there. He's like, I want to do something cool. You know, like, I've seen it in the movies. I've seen it. Like, I want to do something cool. He's like, well, he's like, he's like, I was a grunt. I don't recommend you being a grunt because you're going to hate life. He's like, but I'll go ahead and, and put in some paperwork for you, see what your score is like. So, obviously, my initial score was super low. Like, you, your, your score is not enough. So, then I was sneaking over there with my friends, and I would go do practice tests with, like, some of the guys that had already graduated. And uh, eventually my grades got up enough to get like the bare minimum freaking MOS. So I ended up going as motor transport. So I was like, what's that? They're like, oh, you're pretty much gonna drive all the Hummers, you're gonna drive all the seven tons, you know, you're gonna be in their turret, you know, you're gonna be out with the grunts, you're gonna be doing stuff as a grunt too. And I was just like, all right, let's do it. So then obviously I came home, told my mom, I was like, hey, I wanna join the Marine Corps. And I was only 17, she's like, absolutely not. She's like, you're not gonna do that. Um, you know, obviously being old school or Spanish, he's like, he's gonna put you at the front because you're Mexican. You know, they always put all the people of color and Mexicans at the front of the war and we don't want you to die. And I was like, that's that's not true. And I'm thinking, I was like, for, for a second, I was like, maybe it is true. <laughs> you know, I was like, I, I don't know. I've never been to where I've just from what I've seen in the movies. Um, so I was like, well, I wanna join. She's like, no, I'm not gonna sign off on your, because at that time, obviously what is to now, it, you have to be 18 to sign on your own, or if not, your parents have to consent to it. So I was like, okay, well, I'm still gonna go because eventually when I turn 18, you have no say. And she's like, well, no. So for two years, she battled with me because I was still continuing to go to these police programs. And then she kind of found out that I was going there. And it was, I think it was twice a week, we would go, go run, learn cadence, uh, learn the phonetic alphabet, teach you about the Marine Corps order, the, Marine, or like the history, like everything, you know, because. Those guys that were just coming out of boot camp. So to me, I was just like, man, I was like, I want to be like him. Like, I want to be able to, you know, walk around like him, have that confidence, um, go around, be like, hey, I'm a Marine. Like, like, what's up? You know, I'm superhuman. And then, you know, so I continued on for two years. Finally, when I was a senior, I don't know what happened. And she just came around and she said, you know what? I, I guess the last two years haven't been enough for me to convince you from not going. So I'll go ahead and sign the paperwork. Um, go go ahead and set it up with your recruiter. I'll go over there with your dad and we'll see what happens. I was like, all right, thank you. And I was like, I was happy that they, she finally, um, you know, was happy with me doing something for myself because the whole time it was just, no, you're not going to do that. 
you're going to go to school, you're going to get a job. And I was like, I, I don't want to go to school. Like, it's just not me. Like, I never like going to school. The only reason why I like going to school is because of my friends. And I was always at the class clown. I was getting in trouble, you know, doing a kind of bunch of funny stuff. And I was always getting in trouble. So then my dad obviously was like, hey, you know, you're going to be a grown man. Um, it's time for you to decide what you want to do. He's like, I would rather you stay here and just work. But, you know, it's 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 coming to that time where it's time for you to take initiative and this is what you want to do. I support you. I was like, okay. I think he kind of just wanted me to just go and take off and he was like, do your thing. <laughs> you know? So then um, towards like right before I ended up going to boot camp, like I graduated in July, finally, with a diploma because I had to stay after school almost every day. I would go for two hours on night school and then I would walk to go work at Little Caesars because that was my first job. I became a supervisor there, which was kind of weird. Like I was only freaking 15 and I was a supervisor of grown adults. Um, so I was working there for a few months and then I went to go work with my dad. And like me, me and my dad's relationship was always kind of like, was kind of, I wouldn't say rocky, but he was just the dad, like old school Hispanic, like you do things my way. Like, I'm not really going to show you love. Like, this is just the way it is, just old school. And that's just the way I saw it. I was like, that's how I'm going to be too. You know, so we'd, we'd carpool, obviously, to go to work together. And we never really talked. Like, we never had that, like, close bond that you hear some other people have with their dad and their mom. It was just kind of like, I'm the dad, I'm the mom. You listen to me. These are the, this is the right and wrong. And this is the way it's going to be. We're like, okay, let's, let's do it. Um, so looking back, you know, that's I, I kind of wish that we had that. And it was kind of a lot on me because I was just a asshole of a teenager. I just didn't care. Um, I was always the one causing problems and anything like being disrespectful, uh, which now I can see it. Now that I have a 14 year old, now I can see it. Luckily, he's not like that. He's complete opposite. But so then back to going to the brain course, when I saw my contract, I was going to ship out in January. And then they called me, like, I think it was like November, like, hey, uh, you got to get your stuff ready because you're shipping out next week. And I was like, no, I was like, I can't. I was like, I got, I got plans. I'm going to Mexico. You know, I got, I'm throwing a party. Like, I'm doing these big things before I go to boot camp, but I can't. And they're like, oh, well, you're the government's property, so you have to go. And I was just like, oh, shit. So that kind of scared me. And I was just like, hey, mom, they're calling me. They have to go to boot camp next week. She's like, no, que estén chingando. She's like, no te vas a ir. And I was just like, well, they told me, like, I already signed the contract on government's property. And then she's like, no. And then one of my friends that had graduated from boot camp, she's like, no, they can't do that. Like, once you sign the contract, you're going to leave that day. All you got to do is say no. Like, there's nothing they can really do. Um, and I was just like, hopefully he's right. <laughs> so I called him back and I was just like, hey, I can't go next week. I was like, it's either January or I can't go at all. They're like, oh, well, well let me see what I can do because we got to fill that slot because somebody else, you know, couldn't make that slot. And I was like, well, I'm just letting you know that I can't make it. So they call me back and they're like, hey, uh, we're able to get things figured out. You're going to go in January? I was like, cool. <laughs> so then everything kind of smoothed out. Went to boot camp January, graduated uh, April 5th, and then went to, uh, and then when I graduated, I think I uh, went straight to MCT. So when MCT, I remember calling my mom. I was like, I think I'm done with this. Like, I don't like it. I'm always going to yell at um, it's hard. We do a lot of hikes, and I was just complaining. She's like, "Mingo, that's what you wanted." She's like, "Now you got to finish it." She's like, "I can't let you. I can't support you to quit." She's like, "You gotta, you gotta see it through." And I was just like, "Damn!" I was like, "That's not what I'm gonna hear." But thank, thank you for giving me that talk, you know. So, so I continued. Obviously, I didn't quit. Um, went to MOS school, and then MOS school, um, they give you three choices to pick: whether East. West or overseas. My last pick was overseas because I was born and raised in Cali. I was, you know, I was home raised. Obviously, I was, I wanted to be home closer to California. So I picked West, East, overseas. They freaking sent me to Okinawa, Japan. I'm just like, oh, shoot. I was like, I'm going to be there for two years. I'm not going to come home. I don't know anybody. But luckily, I knew some of the guys that were with me. So I was like, hey, I mean, this is, this is what we signed up for. You know, let's do it. Um, so I checked into Okinawa. Um, I was there for two years, you know, as soon as I got there, they're like, hey, these are the guys that are coming back from Iraq. So I just got back from Iraq. Um, you know, you see these guys walking around, and you're like, damn, like, these guys, these guys seen some shit. You can just see that they just walked around differently. They they give a different vibe, you know. And I was just like, okay. I was like, I guess, you know, this, is, this shit is real. Um, so we did a bunch of uh, pre-training for that, that first deployment. 
first deployment was in uh, 2006. I went to Al Assad. Um, I got attached to a security team. So we were pretty much kind of like a QRF team. Uh, it was just Humvees, and at that time we had no seven tons. We had some some up armored. Uh, we didn't have any like the ID detectors or nothing like that. So we were QRF. So anytime somebody was hit with an ID or they needed a extra a response team, we would go out in the system. We'd go out and escort like uh, any, any engineers that needed to go do workout on the streets, like outside in the city. We kind of just set up a corner around the city. Uh, we did a little bit of patrols here and there. Um, it was fun. It was fun, like while I was there. But I didn't know that everything that I did there and like the things that I went through were going to affect me later down the road because I was young, you know, I was 18, you know, I, we would get out of the vehicles. I would carry my cable here in the front. So we'd go out, we'd see like wires or we thought there were wires. We start digging around and I'm thinking that this shit could just explode and, and you're done. But that's, that's what the protocol was like. Hey, we don't have time to sit around and wait for EOD. Um, so we just had to take care of it ourselves and go around digging stuff and then just push through. And then there's a few times where we go through one route we come right back probably within an hour and then IDs are going off. Um, and it's just like, man, like I just, we just drove through here. Like, how is it possible that we either A, missed it or two, they knew that we were going to come right back. So they went out and said it. And then they knew as soon as we passed through, they were going to hit those IDs, whether it was pressure point, whether it was timers or cell phone, because they, as time went on, they started getting a lot smarter um, on how to hide IDs and stuff like that um counter a little bit of fire some fires um and some one-on-one -on -one firefights here and there nothing crazy and then that was the end of that deployment and then came back to okinawa and then obviously that's when i started realizing like man i just don't feel the same but nobody else was saying nothing so i kind of just went to flow everything was cool um my two years ended up then i got shipped out to uh, camp pendleton so right away, I checked into Pendleton, like, hey, we're going to deploy within the next six months. So once again, another workup leading up to it. And then during that time, that's when I went my my wife, Jennifer. Actually, so we met um, when I was in Okinawa. I was um, through the phone on social media, MySpace back in the day. So we were talking on the phone and everything, and the message, and I was like, hey, I'm getting shipped back to California. And then she's like, all right, you know, let me know when you get here, call me. So then I called her. So we're, we're dating, dating for a short time, got engaged, got married. So then my first deployment, I was I was already married. And that, that deployment was a lot different because now I had a responsibility. I knew that I had to come home for my wife. It wasn't just me and then my mom and dad. Because obviously my mom and dad, they can still take care of themselves. Like, yes, it would suck, but it was just me. I was young. I was a kid. I didn't have no feelings. It was just like, it was just me. Like whatever, whatever happens, happens. I don't really care. But this one was a lot different. You know, and I always told her, I was like, I always told my wife, I was like, I will never get off the phone and mad at you for whatever it is, because I don't want you, I don't want that to be the last conversation that we have and we go out. And then that's the last you heard of me is me being an asshole because that's not, that's not how it's supposed to be. And there was one time, the whole time that I got mad and it was stupid. It was just because she couldn't answer the phone because she was still at work. And obviously the time frame is, is like 12 hour difference. So I called, she didn't answer. And the times that we're able to use a phone were kind of rare because we're always leaving and we'd come back like at midnight. And then by that time you come back, you shower, you sleep for like two, three hours, you get ready and then you go back out again. So I'm like, I'm pissed off. I'm like, hey, like you can answer the phone or what? She picks up, she's like, hey, I'm at work. Let me call you back. And I was like, well, why, why would you answer the phone? And I clicked and as soon as I clicked, I'm like, Fuck, I was like, no, why the fuck are you And then I called him back in and I was like, hey, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just, I'm an idiot. I shouldn't have done that. I'm just letting you know that I'm about to leave again. Everything is good. Nothing's happening. You know, and everything is healthy. <laughs> Everyone's healthy. No, nothing, nothing's going on. Obviously, that wasn't the case, but you know, I was like, everything's cool. She said, okay, you know, I was like, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened again. And it, never, and it didn't. Um, so fast forward, you know, I came back from a deployment. And I think it was the second night I came back. I remember sitting in the room, just just sitting at the edge of the bed. And you know, when you come back from deployments, they send you to all this training, like post deployment training. You go see the psych and the return to intimacy and like how to have how to be a friend and yeah. <laughs> like they give you like this checklist that you check off to make sure that you're not crazy. 
Yeah. And of course, like, we're not gonna answer that to to be honest. Like we're just gonna check, no, we're good, everything's good. We check the boxes, let's go on, let's keep training. Um, so I remember I think it was the second day I came home, I was sitting at the edge of the bed and I just started crying. And I was just like, I told my I was like, I don't know what's going on. She's like, Yeah, I don't know. She's like, Maybe it's just because you just came back and you're still kind of trying to adapt to the life of here. You're not having to worry about somebody trying to kill you with one of your friends or something like that. So it's just, that's probably what it is. And I was like, yeah, that's probably it. But, you know, I I ignored all those signs, you know, and I was drinking. Like every day I would get a six pack. And at the time we couldn't afford them. So we had a little apartment right outside of Camp Pendleton. We were eating like Little Caesars and Top Ramen and Hamburger Helper. I was drinking almost every day and I was just going to work and everybody else was kind of doing the same. So I was like, I guess it's normal. So then it continued on and then obviously it, then I got out because then they told me like, hey, uh, we're going to start another pre-deployment training to deploy again. And I was like, yeah, I'm not doing this again. Like, I, I, don't, I personally don't think the military is for somebody that has a family, especially kids. I mean, yeah, it does work. It could work. I've seen it work. But for me personally, I just didn't think it was something that I wanted to put my wife and my future kids through and having to move different duty stations and go on deployments and just not have a stability of where, where you are, friends, family. Um, so I decided to go ahead and get out, even though they, they were like, hey, we're going to give you a $40,000 bonus. You're going to go where you want to go. And I was this close to signing it. And then I was like, no, I saw some of my friends get out too. And I was like, I think I'm done. Um, so I was out for a few months and then I, I missed it so much that I went to the reserves. So I did the reserves for, I think it was about three years. Um, so I was actively drilling every month, doing like two weeks a year. And then I got kind of tired of that because I was a sergeant at the time. So these guys that were career reservists would come in on the weekends and they'd be a hot mess, you know, no haircuts, camis were not good, not, <laughs> it was just nasty. So by the time Sunday came, they were semi squared away, but then come next month, it was the same thing again. It was the same thing. And then we were always getting blamed at, like, you're the sergeant, you know, why is this guy late? Why is this guy not here? Why, where's his gear? I'm just like, I don't know. He's a grown ass man. Like, this is this stuff doesn't happen in active duty because you live, you sleep it 24 7. Like, if you're at the motor pool, wherever you're at, and you, you mess up, it's going to come to you to the barracks. And then you're going to have to be staying up all night clean. You know, doing duty, like it just continues. So people know not to mess up. And they're, for the most part, they're always squared away. Obviously, there's those ones that are not so squared away, but they kind of get weighted out. Um, but reservist was just a whole different ballgame. And after that, I just got tired of it and I decided to leave that. So that was the whole, that was a little intro of like growing up relating to the Marine Corps. So. Yeah, you know, it's it's so I was QRF. I started off as a team member, eventually became team lead. I, I was obviously deployed a lot. We're about the same age, but I joined a little bit later. So I didn't go, I, I didn't deploy until 2018. So a lot of the damage was already done, but I, I would hear stories from some of the Marines that I was deployed with, kind of how Iraq was and how Afghanistan was in the beginning of the war and how like you couldn't drive past a plastic bag without being extremely cautious because they because the folks out there was just very rogue warfare at the time there was no there was no rules for them at least yeah. we had all these rules of engagement but for them it was just a circus um i know that you and i have talked a little bit kind of to touch back on what you had said in the beginning and unpacking that a little bit about your parents working um kind of in the agricultural industry did you um during during their time working, I guess essentially in like in the fields of Northern California, were you also going back and forth to Mexico with them? This was this that was, was all before. Pre- right. Yeah. Yeah. How um, so they, they, they came out here in the 70s and then I was I was born in 85. So probably like 15 years before I was born, they were coming and going, coming and going, crossing the border, crossing the border obviously illegally until their stuff was able to get approved and go through the process and all that stuff. And yeah. then my dad, had a, my dad had a green card, but for the longest time he was in denial. I was like, I don't want to be a U.S. citizen. <laughs> he said, I will stay <laughs> Mexican until finally, I think maybe like 10, 15 years ago, he found me. He's like, all right, I'm going to do it. He went to go take his test. And I'm just like, man, I was like, you know more stuff than most of the people that are born here in the U.S. 
You know, it's it's crazy. So every summer, um, right over here in like the Hemet area, there's uh, a few fields that are publicly accessible. Like or there's an orange field, and then there's another like low crop field. I want to say it's like it's root based stuff. Anyway, I always stop there to bring them water because the people who own that property they don't live on the property, so they uh, the folks that are out there and they're not all immigrants, but I'm just like nobody cares about these people. Like, no, there's no water for them. They don't even put a pop-up, like, to give them shade. The conditions even now are really bad. So I can't imagine what it was like for your parents in the 70s when people probably cared even less. My, my family immigrated here in the 70s also, and it was a nightmare for them. But they immigrated to New York City, which was already filled with every flavor of immigrant at that time. So they kind of blended in. What was it like for your parents in terms of, like, condition and their health? Passed away. I was thinking it was a few years ago, not too long ago. Uh, one of my cousins was fortunate enough to interview him prior to him passing away. And he touched on that subject of how he was treated when he was coming over with my mom, which obviously was his daughter, because it's my mom. And then there was, I think, a total of nine of them. So it was my, my grandpa, my grandma, and then all coming over to work out here. And he, he touched on the subject about how they were treated at these encampments um, where they would keep a lot of them in like these like metal buildings out in the middle of the field with no AC, no running water. It was just whatever bottle of water they could get. Um, food was scarce. Um, showers were kind of just on your own. You just use like a water bottle or whatever that you could get. Whatever rags you had, you would just wash yourself kind of and then you go out to work pretty much all day from sunset to sunrise. Um, and they would kind of just drive them around, kind of like, it kind of reminded me kind of like the slavery bit back in the day where they were kind of just, you were just a number. Like, hey, this is your number. This is, you're going to work here. And then once you're done, we'll come pick you up and take you back to your to your home. Not your home, but like the, the place that they were staying at. And then once they're contracting, because they, they were like on contracts. So once the contract in for a certain location or, or whatever it is they were uh, crops for, they were just sent out to another location and just could kind of rent it out. And then once the season went over, then they would have to find their own way to either go back to Mexico, find a place to stay for the winter, and then start all over again in the, the next year. But he would tell me that he would go work and like the people that were in charge of him were obviously just mean because obviously it was you know, all Caucasian people that would just yell at him. Um, they would throw stuff at him and they were just getting paid like nothing. But it was just enough for them to just have something to survive off day by day. Um, and eventually it was just enough for them to save up and then leave that, that type of uh, farm field to a more controlled. Because there's kind of like, I guess, different levels where uh, some of the places you went, they didn't, they didn't treat you like that. They were a lot more welcoming. Like the farmers were, some of them were like third generation Mexicans. So they understood. They understood where they came from, where their parents came from. And they own these like huge farms that cropped a lot of corn, uh, apples, cherries, like all throughout the whole season. So like they would bring a lot of workers and they knew a lot of them, like personally, like they would hang out on the weekends. They would have houses for them, like actual like uh, mobile homes that they would stay in. Although it was like four or five families per mobile home, but it was a lot better than some of the other locations where a lot of the other people that would recently come from Mexico. So it kind of just, I guess, depended on how long you were here and the connections that you made with like the farmers and ranchers and stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. So I, I've heard that before because I know that some of the dynamic and, and it all it also depends. Like I know more about pretty much Southern California and some of how they run things here, but I've seen where um, the like the landowner will actually rent a part of the property to that second or third generation person who has the experience of working that field and then they go out and hire people to work that section um, and usually it's a legitimate house but what I noticed out here and I passed them all the time I finally stopped and I was like are you guys good like do you guys need stuff because it was 110 degrees I had drove past them in the morning at like 6 a.m and they were already out there and I came back at three and they were still out there and I just remember this one woman because she was wearing a bright pink shirt and um, like a 
I don't even know what you would call those. It's a, a fabric hat to cover her like sunshade, like to cover her neck and stuff. I remember pulling over and I'm like, are you guys okay? Like I, I gave him, a, I had a case of water in my car. I gave him a case of water. I had an, um, this pop-up that I always keep in my car. I even gave him the pop-up and they were all really appreciative. They, they bring stuff with them when they start the, the day, but it's 110 degrees. Like no matter what you bring, it's going to get hot by the time you actually need it. So I was just like, it made me really upset because I'm like, this is still, a, these working conditions still exist. And we drive past them all the time and no one, I don't know, I can't say no one, but I didn't see anybody else stopping. So I was like, I think this should be brought to the light a little bit. But yeah, thank you for that. I was kind of curious about how it was, but it's good that they found kind of employment with better working conditions or at least nicer people. Um, After a few years. Yeah, that's, it's crazy that, and these are the people that feed us. Like, yeah, I mean, you go to the grocery stores and a lot of it comes from, from there. Not yeah. specifically maybe here, but like a, lot, a big portion of it does from here or even South America and whatnot, but there are probably way worse conditions than we are here. I think about like, even what comes from like middle America, like there are also people working those fields and it's not the field owner. 99% of the time there, there is hired hands. And I just, I'm just like, bro, this person feeds me. Like I treat them the way I treat my mom. Like when my mom was feeding me like top tier care, but that's, yeah. I guess a conversation for another day. So after the Marine Corps, um, I know that you went law enforcement, how that's kind of a little bit of a stereotypical path. I'm guilty for that as well, but what um, what was that transition like? How'd you like PD in California? We can go a little into that. I know and I'll cut out any spots you want me to, <laughs> but yeah, what was that like? It was good. I mean, um, when I first got out, like that was the, that was the goal was to go straight to law enforcement. Um, while I was still in the Marine Corps, I think I was, I think I had maybe like two months left. I took the test for LAPD. I started going through the process. Um, and then towards the end, I, f I forgot what happened where uh, I think I missed an appointment or something. So then everything got kind of pushed back a little bit. And at that time, it was hard to get into law enforcement. Like during that time, like you'd have hundreds of applicants show up, hundreds of applicants make it to the next step and so forth. So it was really hard to get into law enforcement back in, what was it, like 2012, 2011 when I, and then when I got out the Marine Corps, it was really hard in 2009. So then in the meantime, I took a security job. So I was working there, uh, working like these random places, like at the freaking food for less and just like random hours. They would come like, hey, can you come work? Yeah, I'll be there. And then I was there for maybe a few months and then quickly moved up to supervisor. I was a supervisor, just kind of working a Monday to Friday schedule. And I was going to school to get my uh, associates and then later on my master's in criminal justice because I figured that's going to help me for law enforcement. First of all, now I don't think it really did a thing. I don't think they even look at that really. Um, but I ended up getting my degree, so I was working. And so it took me took me a good year and a half, a little over a year to finally join the San Diego Sheriff's Department. But during that time, I, I got turned down by, I think it was Border Patrol, um, Riverside. And then LAPD and San Diego Sheriff were kind of like the only ones that were like continually pursuing me. Like, hey, come get this done. Everything was fast forwarding and everything. And then during the time that I did my final interview with LAPD, I thought I was ready. But the detective, it seems like he was some old school guy. He brought me in, you know, he's like, hey man, he's like, so you're gonna have to break leather every day. You're gonna be South Central for a minimum three years. He's like, are you good with that? I was like, absolutely. I was like, come on, I just came back from the military. I just got out of, out of I went to war twice. That's, that's what I wanna do, you know? And I think that was around the same time that that one movie came out. I forgot what the cop movie was. Um, oh, um, I know what you're talking about the partner Jake Gyllenhaal and um, other guy, the Hispanic dude, right? Yeah, the Hispanic guy. Yeah, yeah. um, it's it's about yeah. LAPD. Yeah, it's a really um, sad movie. <laughs> yeah, so we saw that, and then my wife was like, "Nope, you're not gonna go to LAPD." So me, <laughs> I was like, "No, it's not even like that. Like, it's just a movie. It's just Hollywood." But I knew it was like that because I had family in LA and we, and we would go there to visit, like just taking the wrong street somewhere, like people would chase us, start shooting at us. Like there's a couple of times where I got chased in my car just because I w went in the wrong street and they're shooting at me because I'm not from there. So I'm just like, that's what I want. But at the same time, I guess I should probably listen to her because she's probably right. And then I'm glad I listened to her because I mean, look at the stuff that I went through with LAP, like all the stuff they've gone through and they're still going through right now. 
So, and I ended up accepting the offer with the uh, Samantha Sheriff's Department. And then even while in the academy and even two, three years in, like they kept calling me like, hey man, like we still want you, like we'll give you, you know, a bonus and this and that, blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, no, I'm good. I think I'm good here. So then I, I would say like the first six, seven years of law enforcement, because I ended up doing like 11, uh, for 2011 to 2022, it was about 11 years almost. I think the first six, seven were good. And then right before COVID and then everything with Brianna and George Floyd, like that's when everything just took a spin. Like everything just started going downhill. Um, they started taking away our rights. Um, we couldn't do this. Policy started changing. Um, you had a controversial going. sheriff out there. The, oh, the yeah. sheriff you guys had is a female, I think, right? When you left? Yeah, when I left. And then we had Gore. Um, I don't know yeah. if you know his story. Uh, but you can look him up. Yeah. He's part yeah. of the whole Ruby Ridge. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. I, I remember that sheriff being extremely controversial. I know you and I had talked about this um, during COVID, how crazy it got for law enforcement. But yeah, it was good, like the first seven years, I think, up until COVID. And then like Brianna and everything just took a turn for the worse. Like people just started retiring early. Uh, the morale just went down. A um, bunch of like non-written policies that were coming out like hey you can't do this you can't do that um you can't do karate no more i'm like really i was like i go to jujitsu and i get freaking put the, put in this thing like every day and i'm fine like, <laughs> yeah tell, tell me when tell me when the last time was that somebody died from karate but they were quick on taking it but they weren't quick on giving us a replacement so you go to the academy and train in karate for almost every day and detect and then now you can't do it but they don't give you a replacement so i was like okay so then now I either have my taser, my baton, my weapon. I'm not going to use my taser because sometimes, most of the time, it's not effective. My mm -hmm. baton, it's going to slip out. So it's either I just go hands on or I run. Um, so it, it got very, it got very interesting. You know, the morale started changing a lot. Supervision, unfortunately, had to do what they were being told by the people on top. I had great supervisors in my first seven eight years, um, but then as the turnaround started changing, a lot of younger sergeants and lieutenants were getting promoted so they started changing as well i wouldn't say it was it was their fault it was just more of a culture um the way just everything started changing in california when it came to law enforcement we weren't really respected anymore nobody liked us so you couldn't have a thin blue line sticker on your truck not that i ever did but you know like some of the guys were like yeah i took mine off because you just don't know you can be at a stoplight you can be at the grocery store and you'll see your car or pass your window out of work because you were just America's most hated, and you still are obviously here in, in California, but um, it was unfortunate. And and then the whole time I was just like, you know, something, something's got to change. I was like, it's either the department's got to change or I can go somewhere else. But then like I have friends in other agencies. Oh, like, yeah, it's kind of the same thing over here. Like a lot of people are leaving, they're retiring, they're going to other states, becoming cops out there. And I was like, well, I was like, I don't know. So like, I think probably 2000, like at the beginning of COVID, all that COVID stuff started coming out too, like we're making kids wear masks and vaccines and like all this stuff that California was pushing. And then we just, me and my whole, we just didn't agree with it. Um, we were pretty vocal about it too, especially like at work and on social media. Um, on, well, on social media, not so much because I was still with the department. So I would kind of just had to be very wary of what I posted or else I'd get flagged and then sent to IA and then have another conversation, you know? Mm -hmm. but it, was, it was very difficult to, to I guess stay cool, calm, and collective, knowing that I still held the badge, but I just didn't feel like I was um, valued, like I like I used to be. You know, I was just more. I was just a member. Like, hey, this is my badge number. This is all you are, and there's already a posting for your 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 position. As soon as you leave, there's already somebody that's going to get hired to come on. Um, below when I left. Uh, I was talking to some of the recruiters they're telling me that they were only able to get probably around 10 people to come take the test, the initial test. From those 10, only about six make it to the next step. So like the pool is just very, very small compared to what it was back in 2011, 2012, you know, back before all, all that happened, you know. So, I mean, it was just, it was just a culture, you know, I was like, it's time, something's got to give, you know. And... We're working 10, 11 days straight. We have mandatory overtime. So 12 and a half hour shift is a long day where there can be rotated shifts, days to nights, every three months. So then 
my son was like, hey, so when are you going to come home so we can go do this and go do that? I was like, I can't. I was like, I got to work. Like, hey, I got a game. Can you come and watch me? I was like, I got to work. And they're like, hey, I have a parent meeting, you know, this and that. Like, can you come? Like, I got to work. And then I was like, I don't want to just keep calling out because then I'm just kind of being a disservice to my partners. Um, some partners didn't care. Like, they were just like, whatever, I'm going to do what I want for myself. Um, but me, I wasn't really that selfish. Like, hey, I'm just going to call off all the time because I knew that somebody else had to pick up my slack. And luckily, I was with a group of guys that were really good. Um, that's kind of like the only reason why I stayed so long because I was with a really good group of guys. Um, because had it not, not been for them, I probably would just bouncing really. <laughs> I don't know if you know about how like reserve deputies work. You basically put yourself through the academy. Yeah. So there's like blocks, like block one, two, and three. So mm -hmm. you do, they're about six months. They're like, it's a night, night school. Um, and you, you can't really do them back to back. Usually you do like, you do, um, your third phase, it's six months. Then you're basically like forever on FTO until you get your, your second phase or second level. And, uh, I did that to see, because I had heard a lot of stuff about even Orange County, LA, uh, San Diego, but we have a really good deputy out here. Um, Chad Bianco. He's, yeah, he's awesome. But because he's awesome, it's created a lot of competition within the sheriff's department. So they, they're pushing deputies out all of the time and they're one of the highest paid deputies. So besides going like Riverside County, I know that um, CHP has seen kind of like an influx of, um, of applicants, but the culture is still the same. Like the couple bad apples somewhere else in the world has created this like dynamic where all cops are bad which is so weird because a lot of my family uh, either went military or went law enforcement nypd and i never in my life viewed even as a minority i never viewed police as the bad guys but it's it's interesting so but okay so you moved to texas how is your family adjusting to to life in texas it's great see there's a little there's a bit, a bit of speed bumps out where with the move, obviously it wasn't as smooth as people may think, like just pick up and then go. <laughs> you know, there's a big process that we had to go through. A lot of it, my wife ended up, you know, she's the one that orchestrated the whole move. She's the captain. She's the one that, the driver of this whole thing. You know, she's the one that did this whole spreadsheet and kind of compared the states that we wanted to go to. Like we had Texas, Florida, Utah, Colorado, um, I think there was a fifth one in there. And she pretty much just kind of went down and did like a little spreadsheet of like gas, um, taxes, um, cost of living, uh, registration, you know, like all the basic things that we kind of don't like, don't agree with California that may be better in other states, gas, you know. Um, so we ended up essentially going between Texas and Florida. Luckily, good thing we didn't pick Florida because it just seems like they're constantly being hit over there with with uh, all kinds of weather. Um, so we picked Texas and as far as location, we kind of just went off of like housing, like what the, the, the prices of houses are because not, not all of Texas is cheap. Like it's all cheap relatively com compared to California, but there's certain locations that are a lot cheaper than others. And it's like the smaller towns, which is kind of where we're at. Our town is kind of growing, but um, nonetheless, like it's, it's cheap. Like you can get a brand new uh, three bedroom, two and a half bath, 300, 380, 400 on a one acre lot, one and two acre lots, um, brand new, which is what we did. Um, but when we obviously when we left, like I, I still stayed with uh, Sheriff Top Armor for I think like another month and a half. Um, but my wife and my son, they went to uh, Colorado to uh, spend some time with uh, my mother in law till I finished my time in Sheriff's Department because our house wasn't going to be done till September in Texas. So I was just, I, I was done with. Um, California, my wife was done, my son was done too, other than the friends that we have, that we still have there. Um, and then also our house just happened to sell within like a week. So we're like, okay, I guess it's, it's time to go. So then we put her up for sale, it sold within a week. And then she went out to spend some time with her mother-in-law while the house was built. I stayed there till July. And then I came out here, I think it was August. And then I already kind of had like a job so essentially kind of with one of the local sheriff's department. So then I got an Airbnb, stayed there for like a month. I was working there for probably like a month. And then they finally told us, hey, the house is going to be almost done. 
So when I flew to Colorado, we, we drove back in the vehicle that we had. And then we get here and like, oh, it's going to be another month because this was delayed and then this was delayed. So now we're spending another month in the Airbnb, which is, which is expensive. So now we keep forking up all this money. And then meanwhile, I'm driving like an hour and a half to work because that's where the Airbnb was that we ended up choosing because of the, the way it was built out for our dogs so they can have somewhere to go pot and stuff like that. Um, so I'm driving an hour and a half. She's driving about an hour to take our son to school. And I was like, man, this sucks. So like, we're just like, it's, it's going to get better. We're like, it's going to get better. Like, it's, it's, this isn't it, you know? So I thought, hey, the house is going to be ready next week. You guys are ready to sign. I was like, all right, cool. So we come over, we sign. The house is finally ours. And things just kind of start moving. So then I ended up being with law enforcement here. I think it was maybe like from August to November. And, and that was it. Like, I just didn't really have it in me no more. Like, that fire for me, like, being law enforcement and I just to serve and I was like, I just didn't have it. And I was like, I don't want to do something that I just don't have the, the fire for. Like, it doesn't make any sense. It's not making me happy. It's just now it's adding stress again. You know, not that the departments here are a little better than California, but it was just like, just it, it still ends up being the same thing. Like you, you're still enforcing the laws. You're still doing this. You're still serving the community, whatever. So I was just like, I'm, I'm done. You know, like it's time to do something for ourselves, you know, because of liability. The schedule was going to be rough too. Again, I was going to go back to 12 and a half hour shifts. And then my overtime here was going to be on call. So instead of California, where it was mandated here, I was on call. So essentially, I was still working. So like I couldn't really schedule nothing on my, on my days off because I could probably get called in. And I was like, I'm not going to live like this. So I was like, I got, I got to do something else. Um, so that was about six months. No, no, not even six months. It was just from August till the end of November. Did you apply for your Leosa? What's that? So Leosa is a federal concealed carry. You can get it after 10 years of military service and or 10 years in law enforcement. So as a Marine, you can, you, I can say, I'll send you the website after this. Um, there's like a Leosa portal. It does, the portal is really the only place that I found you can apply online. Uh, they do charge a small fee, but I had no problems with it. So you basically send in a copy of your DD-214, um, which has your MOS on it. So they're going to see what you did. Um, they'll also see your um, your deployments to show that you handled a firearm because like an admin person who never deployed is doesn't qualify. Yeah. Uh, and then plus your um, you can send in either pay stubs or anything you have from the sheriff's department to show that you like total did 10 plus years. And then what you get is this like federal ID that allows you to carry anywhere in any state uh with the exception of like federal places which are airports and federal buildings mm -hmm. nothing else like that. You, you do not have to comply with state law so you can carry in a school if you want to like you can carry anywhere that they that they allow you which is pretty much anywhere but federal buildings so i say again sure i didn't hear that you cut out so I'll have to look into that for sure. Yeah, I'll send it to you. I got it because California has all these stupid laws with their CCW. And I was like, I'm not doing this. Like, I can't really carry it anywhere. But like my house and in my car. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, I went and got my Leosa because um, I should be able to protect myself anywhere I go. Not just yeah. to, like, to wherever they say I can go. Um, anyway, so I know you opened a gym in Texas. That was like so random. But it also made sense because kind of been a part of the gym culture for a while. Uh, what was like, what was that like? It's a, it's a powerhouse, right? Yeah. Hey everybody. Welcome back to the Dr. V podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Verga. I wanted to let you guys know that I will be starting a new series called path to faith. This is going to be my spiritual journey, me kind of getting back into a position where I have a closer relationship with God. I feel as though I've spent a really long time angry at God. I've gone through a lot. And I think that while I don't think it broke my relationship with God, I do think that it halted a, my journey. It halted my spiritual growth. And I would like to prioritize that once again. I am not a, I'm not associated with any religious organization or any specific denomination of any particular religion. This is simply me reading the Bible, reading other holy books, and just learning from the scripture 
I have already started this. I have this notebook here, which is where I've been keeping my notes and where I've been writing down, you know, just just quotes and things that that really resonate with me. So I have, you know, quotes from Exodus and Genesis. And now obviously the Bible is a very, it was a very long text. So I am not trying to rush it. I'm not trying to get through any particular area of scripture just so I can have a podcast episode. But I have already started and I wanted to share that journey with all of you guys. It will not be hosted on the Dr. Virga podcast. It will be on my website, jessieverga.com, where you can check out Path to Faith and you can listen to the episodes there. I will kind of talk a little bit about spiritual health in this podcast simply because spiritual health and spiritual wellness is a part of wellness, wisdom, and warfare. And I think it's incredibly important. So if you are interested in kind of listening to me go through this journey or maybe you you know you want to leave a comment for me or maybe I missed something in terms of lessons and things to be learning from the scripture that maybe I've missed or overlooked or maybe that you don't agree with my interpretation of it I would love your feedback again I am doing this alone I do not have a mentor I'm not affiliated with any church or any religious organization so I I'm looking forward to interacting with you as I go through this this journey once again. So if you, again, want to check it out, it's jessieverga.com. You can check out Path to Faith, and I will see you there. God bless. Yeah. So we're we're part owners of the Part House Gym. Um, essentially, the place we were staying at, the Airbnb, um, that gym that we were going to was one of the gyms that we ended up becoming part owners. So we would go there, like we liked the environment, we liked how clean it was, like we liked the equipment. And then, like, that was our goal in California is, like, Within five years, we're going to open up a gym. We're going to be part of a gym. We're going to manage a gym. Like somehow we're going to be in the gym industry because obviously my wife has a personal training background and I've, we both have competed in the past. So it's been something that's been part of our lives for probably like the last 10, 15 years. And I've been working out since I think I was like in high school, I guess. Um, but we're like within the next, within five years of going to Texas, that's going to be the goal. And it just happened to be that I met the owners and I was like, hey, what's going on? Like, I introduced myself, my wife, and I was like, we just moved here from California. We really like your gym. Um, we're looking to see if you guys are interested in maybe you know, joining the partnership or if you guys are looking to maybe sell or somewhere, somehow we can, you know, become partners in some sort of speak, you know? He's like, you know what? You know, it's crazy that you bring that up because me and my wife have actually been talking about that, that we've been wanting to partner up with a young couple that's fitness oriented, that has a background in fitness and has a love for it. And is not just wanting to come in just because there's money involved or it's a gym and they can just say that they're, they have, that they have it, a gym ownership, you know? And I was like, no, it's, it's not even about that. Like, it's just something that we've always wanted and we always want to help give back to other people by also being part of it. Like, it makes no sense to be part of something if you're not even going to be involved in it, you're not going to be working out. So he's like, yeah, so we, we had several meetings within like two months, and then we ended up doing the whole process of joining partnerships, which I'm sure you, you know what that process is like. It's it's long and it's tedious and involves lawyers and everything like that. So we became partners of that gym. Um, so then I took full responsibility of all the social media and everything like that. So I was posting everything from there. And then they're like, we're going to be building two, three other ones within the next year and then just continue to grow because the the one there was just so successful and we know that we've already built a brand just from this one here even though powerhouse is known worldwide um but just the people around us already know like how great of a gym facility this place is so then we opened up another one in february of this year and then i, I was doing some social media there but then i kind of laid off of that one i was just doing the one in weatherford which we just opened up um two weeks ago or a week ago so then because i was just it was hard to handle for uh instagram accounts trying to go back and forth and like mm-hmm. is this my account and there was a few times where i would post something and it was my personal account trying to post something else as i started to go to media i was like this is just too much like it's a job in itself to to do social media so then i i, I dropped those other two accounts and only kept two and then our manager ended up taking those two accounts um so yeah now we're mainly focus on the one that we just opened up and then all the future ones up. Yeah, because the the original powerhouse is in Texas, right? 
Yeah. The original. Yeah. I I uh, I've been meaning to go to that one. I don't like the not to bash the franchise because I used to go to a powerhouse in New York and it was my gym. I loved it. I would go to Gold's gym and I would go to Powerhouse. Um, the one in here, the one in Temecula, California, California. is awful. <laughs> I don't yeah, know what it, I really do. it's, it's, not, it's different. <laughs> yeah, it's the management. They always mess up my contract. I always pay my contract a year in advance in cash. Yeah. And they just don't know how to handle that. Uh, I don't like the month to month thing. Like just I'll just pay the year up front. Like just here you go. But that one has like the boxing gym, like the, the boxing ring in the middle of the gym, which I thought yeah. was really cool because my background is in boxing. So I was like, oh, that's legit. But the it's just weird. It's just so weird. But yeah, next time I'm in Texas, I'm gonna have to come check out your gyms because uh, I saw the pictures. They look clean, like nice. I'm like y'all yeah. actually treat your. It's funny because uh, when you when you're talking about going to the recruiter's office, it made me laugh because when I the reason why I joined the Navy initially was because I walked into the Marine Corps like recruiter's office and no one was there, and there was like one pulley. He was like changing, and I was like, "Where's everybody? Like, where's all the actual Marines?" He was like, "Oh, yeah. they're all at the gym." <laughs> and, and I was like, I should have known. And then I turned around and went into the Navy's office and they were all eating lunch. I was like, oh, that should have been my first. <laughs> that should have been my first like clue. But uh, and then when I after I got out of the Navy and I went back to the Marine Corps recruiter, uh, it was the same thing. They were all in PT gear. I didn't know yeah. who was who. I don't know what their rank was, but they were like, oh, yeah, they're like, we work out every second of the day because uh, yeah. the Temecula recruiter or not the I guess they're technically Temecula. They're in like a shopping center and they spend 99% of their time kind of like as a presence in that center. So they're always outside running or they're running down Winchester or I'm like, okay, this is, this is it. <laughs> this is the the right way. I went reservist. I don't know if you know that, but I, and you're hundred percent right. There's like no military bearing in the reserves unless mm -hmm. you find someone that was prior service, which I think is really weird. But yeah. um, so, okay. So you started the gym um, and so you, you're no longer with the law enforcement agency in Texas. So you're working full time for the gyms, basically, or for yourself. Um, I actually worked for started as a, just a regular security officer um, in November, two years ago almost. And then I was there for maybe about a year. And then a supervisor position come up. And obviously, there's guys that have been there for 15, 20 years. And I was just like, man, I was like, I'm not ready yet. I've only been here for a year. Like, you're not even a year yet. And then my supervisor at the time was like, hey, you should put in for like your background alone, your experience. Like, just by the like, one year you've been here, like, we, we think you're ready. And I was just like, I don't even know how to stuff still. But I was like, okay. So I put in, I did the interview, and I just I did good. I got the position. So now I'm a supervisor. Uh, essentially, kind of just sit in the cubicle, essentially, and then make schedules and make phone calls and you know, email and talk to a lot and have a lot of meetings, a lot of one-to-one -one meetings, something that I'm not used to having with like, um, I guess leaders that are way above me in the company. Um, we have like a lot of ambassadors that come from other countries. We have a lot of people that are like, I guess, like senators, um, like a lot of people, important people that come to. And I'm just like, I was like, I'm not supposed to be doing this. Like I'm, I came from the freaking fields, you know, being the worst in my class and I was like, but here I am. I'm just like, okay, I guess this is it, you know. <laughs> so it's definitely That's... a weird feeling. So you are supervisor for security there, or is it like just this oh dang, that's yeah. pretty dope. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Like you went from yeah. like not really doing well in the ASVAP, which is crazy to think to like a successful business owner managing essentially a multi million dollar company or an aspect of it. That's insane. It's funny how that works out. Like how much we grow just in all aspects. Yeah, the last question oh, well, for starters, um, I want to make sure that I do like a quick random little little blurb. So I had kind of met you on social media. I don't know if we ever actually like met in person. I know we went to like the same jujitsu gym, the same gym for a minute. And then separately, I complete like completely separately, I found your wife on social media. She had, I was looking for a posing coach for myself and uh, one of my clients who was a, uh, she was a bikini competitor. And then your wife was like, oh, I'll, I'll take care of it. So I went to your house, not knowing that I had already kind of met you on online and then met your wife. And I was like, oh, there's a, a Marine here. Like, she's like, yeah, it's my husband. And I was like, oh, that's pretty dope. Like having no idea that you two 
were connected and it wasn't until it wasn't until like I went to go message her afterwards I think and I saw our mutual friends which was you and I was like holy shit like I inadvertently knew both of you at the same time and she was dope the the client that I had that she was helping um she if I remember correctly she placed second and then her second show she placed first she was the last um competitor that I trained but your wife did an amazing job with her posing so that's pretty dope um but anyway yeah so kind of just like to wrap things up a little bit how now that you're settled in Texas and now that you started this like second chapter in your life at still a pretty young age like do you have any like future plans like what's kind of like you have a couple kids right just one, oh just oh he's and he's 14 so what I mean damn that's crazy because you're like my age and you have a 14 year old. I have no kids. <laughs> um, so what's kind of like the five year plan? Like he's going to be a grown ass man at that point. But like, what's the what's the future look like for you guys? Yes. You probably saw it. This is our company that me and my friend started. He's back in California still with the department. Um, he's doing some cool things there. I'm not going to say what he does or who he is because he wants to keep. Well, you'll, you'll probably know who he is, but I'm not going to say what he does. We do some cool stuff um so we decided to start it i mean we've been talking about this for a while now and then we're like hey we want to provide a lifestyle essentially lifestyle brand that pretty much focuses on anybody that works hard every day no matter what the obstacle can come it doesn't matter where you're from what you believe in what color you are because we're not about that we're not about saying because you this you this it's just you get up you work hard you continue to move forward no matter what it is to put food on the table Put a shelter over your family and just continue to thrive which is probably a good percentage of the population i would think um and we're like because all the other companies kind of like have a little bit of this and a little bit of that but like this one kind of like this is for most of the population because i mean realistically right now we're in some weird times transition times and we're like right now i think we could have something that can just include everybody and not be so divisive on like what what it is you know what color this is or what color that is you know it's more of just like hey get up be humble you don't need to be flashy and say like oh i do this and i do that um well every once in a while it's okay to be flashy because i may inspire somebody else to be like oh they they have that i think i can do that you know like if he can do it i can do it you know because i that's how i've kind of looked at some people too like i don't really i don't get jealous when i see people doing better than me it's it's good it inspires me and then I'm like, okay, if he can do that, I'm going to try to do that, but better. Um, so that's that part of the company that we just started. And then as far as here, with my wife and then my son, essentially, it's kind of just continue to move forward. Um, our house that we initially bought was one acre. We purchased another acre and a half, so we added more to the property. Um, compound, we're going to add some, probably some chickens and some goats and, you know, like, we, we don't really know what the future may hold, but we'll just continue to move, whether it's we still stay here in this house or we buy a bigger house on a bigger ranch. Um, we don't know, like the possibilities are endless, you know, like there's just a lot of things that, that we can do and, you know, that everything is, is open. Yeah, no, I respect that. I think having an idea of like, I know I want to grow, but I don't know exactly what that means. So, no, that's that's awesome. What, um... So the brand that you and your friend started, is it just apparel or like how, um, wh what's the future for that company? Cause I know it just, you guys are just starting it now. Yeah, it's just, right now it's just apparel. Um, it's pretty much just a representation of like, okay, this is what we are. This is what the company represents. Um, but obviously as we, as we continue to grow, I will, we'll probably add something like services, whether it be some sort of coaching, um, you know, cause his background is very deep and like, flying around and stuff like that and cool stuff. I have some background in it from the military and then I have a lot of stuff, but I think um, we'll, we'll definitely be, be adding some stuff with that. You know? Yeah, that's interesting. Have you, um, I know Tim Kennedy has a, like a training academy out in Texas. He, um, his primary focus is he started his own school. Do you know who Tim Kennedy is? Yeah. Yeah. So he started his own school. Like I always thought like if I had kids, I would move to Texas just to send them to Tim Kennedy school. Cause like on top of meeting the state requirements, cause there's obviously standardized tests that the kids still have to take and whatever else. But on top of all of that, he teaches them like life skills, like how to critically think and 
introduction to taxes and all of things about being an adult. And then there's also, uh, they have like an airsoft class. So they teach them like tactical weapons handling and um, close quarter combat and, and those are like CQC sort of stuff. So that um, I think if he, I think he kind of is looking at helping kids because I think he found that most adults are somewhat helpless, but I don't think that most adults are helpless. I think that if there's resources out there for them, kind of like how you're saying where it's like an all inclusive, like it's not just for one particular section of the community, it's for everybody. Um, I look forward to seeing um, your super secret friends, <laughs> uh, you know, ability to kind of spread your company out. Are you guys going to have a location or this might be a little getting a little ahead of myself, but are you guys going to be selling in person? And if so, will it be in California and Texas? We, we already kind of started selling some in person to our, our friends that we know um, our hats. Like we I think we our first order, we had, I think, about 15 hats sold out within like the second day. Um, we're currently back ordered because of the whole lockdowns of like the people at the ports. So kind of like push things back. And then these shirts, I just got them, I think it was four or five days ago. I got these ones and there's another order. I order from two separate locations because these are all local. Like we're not doing overseas wholesale stuff like that. Like these are local as well. I got it on border locally. I'm um, trying to support local businesses. Now, if, if we're going to continue to do that, we don't know. Like it all depends on the members, like how how things go moving forward. But that's going to be our main goal is to try to stick with local businesses um, because we're supporting them and they're supporting us by helping us out and, and make the party for us. Um, but it's, it's been it's been a lot of learning experience, especially when it comes to clothing. You know, doing your um, getting an EIN. I was like, what's an EIN? So I had to learn up how to get an EIN number. I had to learn how to get a seller's permit. I was like, seller's permit, can I just like sell this stuff? They're like, no, I mean, you got to get protection. You got to have a lawyer because if people are going to come for you, they're going to want to sue you because they don't like something or you said something. I'm just like, man, like, like the, we've hit a lot of speed bumps that I think that's why a lot of people don't start it or they stop and they don't even get to make it to succeed. Um, but we're like, we're just gonna keep going with it. Like if it takes longer, like it'll just take longer, but we're just gonna make sure that we, we produce something that's good product that I would I would want to buy. Like we've gotten some hats. I'm like, I don't want this. Like we're not gonna sell that. We're not gonna provide this for for our people, and then we'll, we'll take it back or I've thrown them away because it's just not something that we want to provide. Same with their shirts. Like we've had three different boarders take care of them. And then we look at them, we're like, this is not the way I want it. Like, I don't like this quality. I don't like this print because it's all about prints, different type of shirts, you know? And I was like, this is this is a lot. So we're constantly like looking at videos and listening to other people that are already doing it, like how they started it, how they're doing it. And it's just like, once you think that you're like, all right, I think we're good right now, then something else comes in. And then like we got shut down on Etsy because they said that we weren't creating our own stuff. Like I wasn't. Like there's a piece of paper, I had to make an airplane and then sell it. They said that because we bought a shirt, we sent it somewhere, they did it for us and then we sold it, that that was illegal. And they don't have an actual person you can talk to. There's no customer service rep other than just email. So they shut us down. So right now we're going to be going to Shopify. The website's almost done. Um, my partner's uh, Mario. You can say his name is Mario. Um, he's working on it right now. So it probably will be done today or tomorrow. He's uploading the pictures and then but yeah it's, it's it's been fun it's been it's been real fun yeah all of my businesses at some point in time we've sold apparel and it's just a, such a pain in the ass like i want the bella canvas 3001c not the, just the 3001 and then i want it silk screened and i want it to be screened in four screens and like you become an expert in everything by the time you're done running your own business like especially especially if you're just doing it with like one or two people but yeah, no, I look forward to seeing your Shopify store um, up and running. Let me know if you guys need any help with that. Uh, I've done that. I've built a few Shopify stores in my time. So if you guys run into any problems, let me know. Uh, but yeah, no, thanks for thanks for coming on. Um, do you, Is there any last thing you want to say or where can people reach you? Um, I think I have your social media link, so I can link that. But yeah. Any I think I just want to touch real quick on mental health. Um, because I guess that's something that gets overlooked a lot and lately, and I think the last few years, it's been really big, and especially in law enforcement. Um, obviously, a lot of our brothers take their lives. The military, too, post-traumatic stress. I don't call it syndrome because it's not a syndrome. It's just post-traumatic stress. Um, 
So just go get checked out. I mean, because when I got out for years, I wasn't, I never got, went to the VA. I denied everything. I was like, I'm not going to go because there's somebody out there that's missing a limb. They're missing an eye. I was like, they, they can have that help. I was like, oh, I'm good. I'm still walking. I still have my arms, my legs. I can still see. I can still hear. I was like, I'm good. But inside, you know, I wasn't. And then my wife would tell me time and time again, she's like, you're not sleeping. You're having nightmares. Uh, you're drinking. You're, you're, you're up and down. You know, you're always looking around. I was like, yeah, that's, that's normal. I and mean, that's what kind of what happens when you go from military deployments to law enforcement. You kind of have to keep looking over your back and stuff like that. She's like, no, but you, you do it all the time. She's like, you need to go see somebody. So then finally, I went to go see, you know, a psych. I was talking to a psych for a while right before COVID hit. Um, and that really, really helped a lot, seeing, talking to somebody in person, you know, talking to them about what bugs me. Because there's certain things that just keep coming back. And I'm like, I just, I can't get rid of them. Um, but going in and talking to them was really, really helpful. So in a combination of that, and, you know, not a lot of people know this, but there's a handful, of, I won't say a handful, but a couple of times where I was close to pulling the trigger because I was like, you know what, like, I'm done with this. But the only thing that kept me going was my wife and my son. I was like, I can't do this. Like, this is just, it's a selfish act because, yes, my issues will be done. But their issues have not just begun because now that I'm not here, like who's going to take care of them? Like who's going to provide for them? Like I'm supposed to be the provider and be here to protect them till the last day that I'm here. But by me wanting to kill myself, like what's that? What's that do to me? You know, like I'm just done. So as much as people say, like oh, you know, like you know, people are going to kill themselves. Like yeah, but you said you, you can still go get help. But people are just the ego. They don't want to go get help. I mean, like, I'll go, I'll go check myself in if I need to, because I know that I'll still be here the day, the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Um, and I just can't see myself not being here. And then knowing, like, how's my wife doing? How's my son doing? Like, he's a teenager now. He's 20. Like, like he, he has a question for me. Like, he's going through problems, like, and I'm not there to help out. So that's one thing I, I try to... I guess, um, push on a lot of veterans, especially law enforcement too as well, um, is go get help. Like, you don't need to tell your supervisor, you don't need to tell who you're working with, like, hey, I'm going to go get help because extra pressure, like, they're going to look at him next week because I'm going to go get help. Go get help, go see somebody, um, get better because life is short. And the last thing you want to do is end it all because one bad day. Because, you know, some people are just one bad day from that last day. And I don't want to get that phone call because I've been on that side where I've talked to people um, from the military that I served with in, 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 in Iraq. And I'm like, hey, you know, like, what's going on? Like, I'm done. Like, I'm just, my wife is divorcing me, like, my kids. And I was like, really? So I was like, you'll be okay. And then next week I get the phone call, like, hey, social section commander suicide. I'm just like, fuck, so it's kind of like, I should have gone. Like, I should have flew out there. Like, I, like, what could I have done? And then you start getting that guilt. You know, like, what, what could I else, what else could I have done? So I'm an open book. Anybody can, you know, call me, text me, social media, whatever. Like, I'll, I'll tell you how it is. Like, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not working for a department anymore. I'm going to tell you how it is. I, I can't really, I can't really stay quiet anymore. You know? <laughs> so I have the freedom, you know, to actually express myself and not fear of IA or somebody coming after me because I'm actually telling my truth and telling people to take care of themselves and, make sure that your insight is, is good. You know? No, thank you for saying that. I, I'm a huge advocate for therapy. I even wrote a book on veterans well-being and gave it away for free because I was just like, I want to make sure that everybody is prepared. I think that really does hit home for me a little bit. I remember the first time I rolled up to secure a scene for someone who had taken their life. And I was just like, what would have what would it have been like if they were just if they just had somebody that they knew that they could call? So no, that's that's great advice. I'm actually going to leave a couple links at the end of this video. Um, Cohen's Veteran Network is a great resource for not just veterans, but for anybody who's struggling with mental health. There's a couple of the links and resources that I have for nonprofits. So if they don't have a disability rating and can't get health care or um, help through the VA, which they should be able to, um, or if they don't have their own health care, um, I'll leave some links to some nonprofits that can help them out. Same thing with the uh, give an hour is another one. I even went through them myself. Um, mm -hmm. They they will set you up with a mental health provider for free, virtually or in person, whatever your preference is. So yeah, thanks yeah. again for being here. Uh, shout out to the family for 
uh, holding it down while I talk to you for over an hour. Uh, tell your wife I said hi. I'm going to hit yeah. her up on social media because I know she could paint. Like, I'm going to need one of those yeah. paintings. <laughs> this, is, this is one of them. She's got a, she's got a few. Yeah, I, that's the first thing that I saw. I, I'm an art collector. And I saw that and I was like, very Texas, but very nice. I was like, okay, yeah. I'm going to hit her up. <laughs> so, awesome, man. Thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, I'll leave links for all your stuff um, in the description. So. Hey, salute. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you. Appreciate what you're doing. And if anybody has any questions, anything, reach out on my open book. Everything's good. One life. Awesome, man. Thanks. Hey guys, I wanted to interrupt this video real quick and remind you that my free guide, Wellness, Wisdom, and Warfare, A Veteran's Guide for Mastering Life, is now available for download using the link in the description or if you go to my website, jessieverga.com slash free guide, or it's under the podcast tab, you can download it for absolutely free. It's over 60 pages of just tips and tricks and things to help my veterans out there master their health, master their fitness, master their mental and spiritual health, just things that I've learned through my journey as just a veteran and that I've learned as an educator and as a professional in multiple fields, as an entrepreneur. I put all these things in one place and I've put it together for absolutely free. So again, Link is in the description, or if you head to my website, jessieverga.com, you can download it for absolutely free. Mm -hmm.